So welcome to Spectral Processing Basics, uh, powered by Never Engine Labs. My name is Gustav Scholder, as you probably already know. And we will talk about um, what kind of data is actually inside um, the, when you do a spectral analysis, what kind of data do you get out and what can you do with it uh, before you resynthesize the data. So let's start with the sum of signs, the basic principle of this. Just blowing up my phone, okay. So let's start with the sum of signs. Um, basically, you're sending audio into the analysis. Then you get an array of amplitudes and frequencies for each sinusoid or sine wave, actually. Uh, and then you put that array into the recent thesis, which is usually an oscillator bank, and you get audio out. But if you look at that in Kima, looking at this wire here, that's the reason actually why Pete Johnston called this the wire between, because it's just a, an ordinary stereo, stereo wire. You don't see any parallel uh, wires going from the spectral analysis to the oscillator bank. So, how do they do that? Actually, we need to transfer, uh, like if you do a 256 uh, partial analysis, you need to transfer uh, 256 individual amplitudes and frequency data to the oscillator bank. And they do it in a single stereo wire. So there has to be some other technique than uh, parallel uh, transmission. So we'll just open up this sound here. I, that's actually the same sound as we had before. Uh, I just placed an oscilloscope inside uh, this wire to see what's going on in there. Just keep looking. Uh, is it okay for everybody? I just want to double check before I go, uh, before I go on. There might be some sort of delay as well. I just want to make sure that everybody can... Okay, seems to work great. Okay, nice. So... I place this oscilloscope inside this stereo wire to see what's going on. If we play that sound... So what we see here is the left channel and the right channel of that stereo wire. And we're... It's, uh, you probably already know that, that the left channel transfers the amplitudes and the right channel transfers the frequencies. So, in this case, I'm still having serial data, not parallel data, like I would expect in, a, in, in, a, in an array, right? So, what you see here is uh, amplitude 1. I'll just zoom in twice. So, this is one frame. Uh, we will see that better in my presentation. I'll just to go over there. So a frame actually is an array of data. So what we see is a, a stream of amplitudes. I'm, I'm uh, discussing the amplitudes now for the frequencies. It's, it's exactly the same. Uh, we see a stream of amplitudes going in time. And 
if we divide that into frames, like uh, in, usually th there are much more than six sample frames. Usually the analysis is doing uh, like 256, but for simplicity we will do six samples. So uh, if I divide that into, uh, if I think of that as uh, framed data, um, I would just divide it into uh, six sample frames. Uh, again, six samples just because uh, we we are assuming this is a six partial analysis or something, right? So these are the frames. And these actually, uh, that's actually the same as you would do in CopyTalk if you do uh, an array and do one, two, six, collect uh, E, a value suffix to E, then each value would, this would be value one, two, three, four, five, six. And then it will again be value one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And the update speed would be six samples. So what's happening in the in this stream of amplitudes is that you that they are actually uh, transmitting this parallel data as serial data. That's the reason why they do it in frames. So. If we look at this stream of amplitudes again, uh, is this really the time axis we are looking at? Or should we rather um, put this, uh, if, we, if we take frame one, two, three, four, and put this uh, right behind each other? Uh, actually, that's the time axis, and these are just samples. It's very, uh, might be very difficult to grasp in the, at the first uh, moment. Okay, um, but uh, actually, what what we hear, uh, the time axis, is actually in the in the z axis. So we we uh, we are getting the stream of amplitudes, and if we take frame one and put it here, frame two and put it here, this is actually like time is moving. So value one, like amplitude one. Uh, will move in time like this. It will have a value of something like 0 0.8 here, and then it will have 0 0.6 and 0 0.3 and 1.0 or something. Um, so don't get confused by this concept. Uh, what, what we hear in the spectral analysis is actually uh, the, 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 the parallel data we are getting from the spectral analysis we are getting uh, the amplitude and the frequency for each sine uh, for each sine wave uh, it's updated um, every like 256 samples or six samples if we go back here uh, so this assuming this would be amplitude one uh, this would be updated every six samples we get a new amplitude for uh, sine oscillator one for example. Uh, just want to make sure, is there any question uh, about this concept? Because it's uh, it's very uh, important that you get this uh, time and samples concept and that actually this data is transmitted in frames which are actually the same as an array. I hope everybody gets it. If not, please ask your question now. I'm just waiting a little because there could be a delay. It's great that we can edit the video afterwards. <laughs> I can cut out the pauses. Okay, that's very good because that's actually the the most difficult part to get. That because usually in the time domain uh, we would look at samples and this would be that the sample domain and the time domain would be the same, but not if we transfer uh, data in frames. 
so let's let's look at an, another sound I made here so we can look at these frames uh, that's again a sample so I can let this run okay so if I set this to manual I can go through that uh, spectral data frame by frame and that's ex actually that's exactly what's happening if you're doing freezing then you're just uh, sticking onto one frame that's that's exactly what we have here notice that a single frame actually sounds very synthetic and not at all like the original sample We can even step through that frames frame by frame so you can see have a look at the at the amplitudes for the frequencies is not that easy to, to to see any difference but if you look at the amplitudes you can see what is changing frame by frame I'll do that now okay Another way to visualize the whole thing would be to put the tempo way down or change the rate. I'm sorry, I should mute when I speak. Um, if I change the rate to something more extreme like 100 and uh, 100 times slower, you will see uh, what I mean again. So this is just a visualization of what happens if you uh, change the rate of your time index, for example. So you see that those amplitudes are changing very slow and that's also the reason why if you put the, the rate really down uh, you would get those synthetic effects because there is no change in, in the sound or there is change but it's very slow. So you get this very synthetic character. This that was just another way to demonstrate these frames. So, okay, so we want to. Oh, can you explain a bit more about what a frame is? Uh, yeah, as I said here, I'm going back. This is a, this a stream of amplitudes. This is just a, a stream of of values, actually. But if I know this is frame data, I can divide that into uh, the frame size, which in this case I chose uh, six samples. And a frame equals to an array. So uh, imagine you're doing this kind of array here. Uh, then you get six values and you can change them and they run in parallel. And that's ex exactly what's happening here. So you have to imagine that they run in parallel um, but they are transferred in serial that's exactly what I wanted to show here so if you take each frame and then put it uh, into uh, onto the z-axis actually then you get this concept of the time is moving actually uh, from from the first amplitude uh, it will move to this value, to this value, and to this value, and the second amplitude for the second amplitude, it's the same. It will move from this value to this value to this value and to this value. So uh, this is an array, and at the same time, a frame. I hope that was clear enough. By the way, you can assume uh, those frames if you're looking into your uh, sp 
oh, there is no analysis going on uh, here. Um, if you look at the lowest analyzed frag, that's the setting for uh, how many partials you're going to analyze or on how many partials you're going to analyze your sound. And uh, this is exactly uh, the same setting that is determining the or the defining the the frame length. So if you choose above 2f, this equals to 256 partials. Um, if you take above 1f, this will be 512. So the only thing you have to remember is that the first setting is 512 samples frame and also 512 partials. Uh, and then you just divide it by two. So the second setting is 256, 128, 64, and 32. Of course, you should usually set that to uh, so it fits with the sample you are analyzing. So this lowest analyzed frag exactly makes sense. You don't gain anything uh, if you analyze something that has no frequencies above uh, 173 hertz and you analyze it with 512 partials, you won't ga gain anything. So uh, usually you should set that so it fits with your sample you're going to analyze. Okay, so now we know how this uh, spectral data, how it works, how it's presented in Kima. Uh, maybe I should note that uh, for the frequencies, the concept of frames is exactly the same, but uh, the, the values are different because they're transferring uh, a value which has to be uh, multiplied by the signal processor half sample rate so if you're working on 48 kilohertz, for example, then you need to multiply that value by 24,000 to get the real frequency value. This is just the scaling. This is just the scaling, actually. Uh, and it's just done so you can transfer that data because, you, as you know, you, in, in, in the wires between modules, you can't transfer any data, which is which exceeds plus or minus one. So they are just scaling that by signal processor half sample rate. And that's also the reason, <coughs> sorry, why you, um, maybe let's take this example again. Um, it's muted, so don't worry if you don't hear anything. That's also the reason, I hope you can see that line actually on the video, uh, why this is going up. It's, it looks uh, like a, like a sawtooth or something, like a <laughs> reversed one. Uh, so th those values are determining the frequency. So if you look here, this is uh, the fundamental, or maybe there is a kick drum right now. So this, uh, the amplitude one is really high, and the frequency, I can't, I can't see it myself here. It's a very low value. So if you would uh, multiply that value by signal processor half sample rate, you would get the according frequency value to that amplitude. Okay, so now that we know how the data is uh, transmitted from the analysis to the recent thesis, what, how, what, how can we manipulate that data? So the initial thought would be to bring them back to uh, parallel because that's actually the way they are meant to. Uh, so if we do the serial to parallel, we could, for example, sample and hold uh, the first value. Again, uh, considering in, in this case amplitudes, but you would do the same for frequencies. So if we sample and hold the first value, we would get a, 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 a stream which is um, uh, the, the, which is exactly what the the first um, like the first index of this array or the amplitude one is uh, doing. So this is uh, the amplitudes of sine oscillator one. If you sample and hold that, then you will get again uh, time and samples in the same domain. So uh, the only thing we have to do now is we need to interpolate those values so you don't get any clicks because then the sudden changes uh, would of course result in clicks. So if you if you do that, 
I'm doing this here with a with a replicator. Maybe some of you have read my blog post about individual oscillator resynthesis. This is exactly that. So what I'm doing is I'm sample and holding uh, for 256 samples. I'm sample and holding uh, the, the, the the voice number minus one means so for the first the the, the first voice will have no offset so this will be actually the sample number one or the amplitude number one or the index one whatever you prefer and if I sample and hold that value and then uh, interpolate that I'm doing that uh, with a um, with a with a gain module because that interpolates at sample rate and I feed that into uh, a single sign oscillator you can see here that I did exactly that what I was talking about before. Uh, I'm multiplying the, the frex or the frequencies by signal processor half sample rate and for the envelope I'll use that what the output of that gain module. So and using this replication I'm doing this for 256 times so this part will be uh, will be done 256 times and I can listen to that too it takes some time. Okay. So we see that works, but or maybe I should have let that run. If you look at the DSP usage, I'm running a Pacarana here and it's, you know, it's nearly full. So this is obviously not the most efficient way to do it. Whoop. Where's schema again? Here it is. No. So this is obviously not the most efficient way to do it. Um, oh God. Okay. Uh, although we could do some funky stuff in here, you could place delays in there or any kind of processing you would like and it would be uh, this this kind of processing would run on every single oscillator uh, this is something you can't do with the oscillator bank but as I already said it's not very efficient so we have to think about a way to manipulate that s data which is presented in serial in, in, in uh, serial data we have to manipulate that so, uh, a very easy example of this is uh, just multiplying, uh, again, this stream of amplitudes here with the six sample frame. And we got four frames here presented. And if I multiply that with a pulse strain, which is only one sample long, uh, and zero for the other ones, what would I get? Of course, I would get the very first value of each frame of each array, whatever you prefer. So that's the reason why we have to do all that manipulations have to be done at sample rate. Because if I would I would do that multiplication, if I would do that not at sample rate, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to uh, generate a one sample trigger so this would smear out uh, if, if if this would be a, a curve that's going like uh, like in a triangle shape down then I wouldn't get the very first one I would also get uh, some some values of, of the other ones too so that's actually the reason why uh, the whole manipulation of that spectral data stream has to be at sample rate I hope that's clear for everybody I'll just wait a little and see uh, for your reactions because this is the second really important thing to grasp that it's not possible to um, manipulate that data with copy talk.
because CopyTalk is only updating every millisecond and every millisecond is not sample rate, so you it, it just wouldn't work. So I'm just waiting a little for questions. Okay, it seems to work. That's great. I assume that there will be more questions about this. At least for me, it took some time to get that. Okay. So, um, let's start doing that. If you look at this sound, so this is just our player, you know this part already. I'm splitting it up, it up into amplitudes and frequencies. Uh, by the way, those modules here, uh, we just made them for visual feedback. So you, you can also use a left channel only and right channel only. You can also use the, the channeler module. Uh, but it was, uh, it, it's much better to visualize if you have an A for amplitudes and a F for frequencies. So what I'm doing here is um, I'm using a product because that works at sample rate. I, if I... I I, I need to use a module to 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 calculate the product. If I would again, if I would do it in copy talk, it would just update every milliseconds and it, it wouldn't work. <clears throat> and the other thing I'm doing is quite similar to this example here. Um, I'm doing a pulse train, and the pulse train has the exact same period as my uh, frame length which is 256 samples. And I can change the duty cycle of this, um, of this pulse train. Okay. So what's happening if I multiply, uh, uh, what's actually happening is, uh, here it is shown for only the first value, but what we get here with this pulse train would be a, um, a low pass, a spectral low pass. Let's look at that and listen to that. Um, okay. Here I can change the duty cycle, so you might pay attention to what I'm doing here and also what's happening here to the amplitudes. See, now they're all gone, so I'm actually killing everything. I only have the very first one. Okay. So that's a that's a way to do some EQing in the in the spectral domain. Is there any questions? Uh, any question about this? Then feel free to ask. Otherwise, I'll continue on how you can generate uh, other control signals. <clears throat> oh, it might be interesting to take a look at how that pulse train is is looking. Okay, calling that pulse train. Whoop. Oh, where is it now? <laughs> okay, lost in monitors. Ah, it's up there. Sorry for that. Okay. I should make 
ganz mal. Okay. So what you see on the left side is that pulse train. So changing the duty cycle, as you see here, as expected. And that's the signal I'm multiplying with the amplitudes. So it's actually very easy. You can do the inverse of this and you get a spectral high pass, for example. Or you could combine two pulse trains and get a spectral band pass, for example. <laughs> okay, questions will come later. Okay, fine. So... Okay, the pulse trains are a nice way to manipulate the data, but the very obvious one one is uh, the synthetic spectrum from array. Because what the synthetic spectrum from array does is <clears throat> I can define an array and it will output that as spectral data. That's exactly what we need. So uh, you probably have already looked into the spectral control signals uh, schema file in the in the spectral lab so there are a lot of these this one is the 16 faders so i'm not going into details about the capitalk i'm using here because uh, i guess you're familiar with with how to how to make arrays or if not we can discuss that in the end um so what i'm doing is i'm generating a synthetic spectrum of frame length i'm defining that here in the script because it's just more practical and <clears throat> these 16 faders uh, get multiplied by my amplitude so uh, these 16 faders are just values we can see that in the oscilloscope display you can see that if I move fader 1 fader 2 so what you see here is the control signal I'm generating. I'm multiplying this signal with the amplitudes. So all amplitudes multiplied by zero will get killed and all the other ones uh, I can scale them. So this is another way to EQ. I made them, I made those uh, faders in a way uh, that I don't, I don't want to end up with 256 faders. This would be sort of impractical. So I grouped uh, the the, ver the first 12 faders are uh, really for the uh, very first um, the for, for the first 12 partials, and up uh, starting from fader 13, I'm starting to group partials together so this is what you can hear and you can also see that here so this is the control signal now I'm, I'm, I'm generating and I can start to randomize that except of the master fader and you get some from pretty wild to subtle uh, spectral EQing. And this is just done by multiplying that cons that control signal I'm getting from the synthetic spectrum from array uh, with the amplitudes. So if you know how to do it, it's not really complicated at all. You're just generating those arrays using a synthetic spectrum from array and then you start to multiply that with your amplitudes for example okay so to do an EQ really we can actually use the product one is is might be a better way to 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 use because the product one um, is multiplying by uh, it can multiply by more than one 
and also the multiplication that the 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 scaling is based on an uh on an exponential scale so this is ex this is really um fitting for amplitudes and frequencies because if you scale something by 0 0.5 you will do minus 6 dB and if you scale something by 2 you will do uh, plus 6 dB and the way the product 1 works is if you set the order to 1 this would correspond to 6 dB you can see that here in the uh, in the product 1 description there is the order and you can see that uh, a setting of 1 would be plus minus 6 dB so then you get those 16 faders and if you move the fader fully up it will be plus 6 dB if you if you move it fully down it will be minus 6 dB so this and also if you do it for the order 4 this would be plus minus uh, 24 dB which I'll do right now and that sounds really better than uh, just scaling them linearly so this is uh, this uh, the product one much more reflects on how we perceive uh, sound Below, uh, below here you will see uh, the control signal I'm generating using those faders. Okay, you already have those sounds in the, in the spectral lab so you can experiment with them on your own. And also I wanted to say that's, that's also the reason why most of the modules of the SPCSR are having a sound input for, uh, in this case, for the multiplier, but for the form and shifter it will be uh, a form and shift input or for the exponential smooth way it's a smoothing input. It has to be a sound because... Uh, it has to work at sample rate again think about it uh, we, to do that we have to uh, ca uh, do the calculation we have to do the calculation at sample rate we can generate the array with copy talk so this is actually the perfect um, connection between sample rate processing and uh, copy talk uh, usage to generate control signals maybe let's take another example so Again, I'm having the 16 faders here to, to do some EQ on the amplitudes. And I'm using the product one and the frequencies. Uh, I'm using an order one here, which <coughs> results into plus minus an octave. And here I'm presenting you another way to generate uh, sample rate control signals, uh, which is using the Xen oscillator. The Xen oscillator is another way to, to do that uh, and you can use CapiTalk inside but it will uh, it will generate uh, a sample rate accurate uh, a sample accurate uh, control signal so it's actually very simple I'm doing I'm just having an two X values and two Y values I, I can move and if I move them all together it will be uh, a usual pitch shift but I can also send the uh, uh, you will see it in the oscilloscope display this is the Xen Ost. it's much easier if you so this is my two-point control signal I'm having x1 x2 y1 and y2 you can name them whatever you prefer but it was just it's just convenient to use it like that. So if I set x on the x-axis, I'm specifying uh, where in the in the in the spectrum I'm I'm doing my y value. You will see that if I do that to minus one and one, the the y one will uh, affect the, the the very first um, frequency in this case because I'm using that on the frequencies, and y two will be for the very last one. So. 
Uh, if I if I raise y1 and, uh, and between those it will get interpolated. I, I think I just show that. So if I don't make this line straight, uh, what's happening is that I'm pitch shifting the the lower values or the the lower uh, indexes or the lower partials um, di different from the higher partials, and I'm doing this with those two values, and the Xen oscillator is able to interpolate between those. Uh, I'm able to uh, pitch shift the lower partials. And then uh, doing less and less and less and less pitch shift until I reach the highest partial, where I do no pitch shift now. We can do it the other way around too. We can uh, start to pitch shift uh, the higher partials uh, and not pitch shift the low partials if I set this 1 to 0 here. And if I move them both, then I get a usual pitch shift, you know. If I if I, I'll just move both to uh, pitch the whole thing an octave down, for example. And you can draw arbitrary curves with that, and you can even use more of this. Uh, right now, I'm using only two points to uh, define. Uh, the, the line, but you can use more of them, of course. For example, in this curve we just see, uh, we just saw is I'm I'm uh, pitching the lower partials down while at the same time pitching the higher partials up. So maybe let's open that spectral control. Where is it? Here we are. Spectral control prototypes. So those are all the prototypes w uh, we have so far. Uh, those are all based on on uh, the Xan oscillator or the synthetic spectrum from Array. And please feel free to make your own. Here's a template you can use for your own creations if you haven't done yet. Um, and you can use those uh, spectral control signals in any of the SPCSR modules or you can even develop your own algorithms and use them there. Uh, uh, for example, if we go to um, this sound here with this moving and freezing, just to show another SPCSR, module. Uh, for example, here we have an exponential smoother. Just make that a little bigger. Okay. We have an exponential smoother and the uh, the input for smoothing is, as I said before, oh, uh, thanks, Louis. Yeah, <laughs> I think so too. Pitch shifting frequency bands is, is very cool. Yeah. Um, so it has an audio input where you can send your control data in. So you, you're you able to not only smooth uh, the amplitudes, you you can also uh, smooth only the lower partials or the higher partials or whatever you prefer. So in, in this case, in this sound here, we are having a, a single fader. Um, so this is... And and we can deter when we can define a bandwidth. So let's look at the control signal if we, if we play the sound, it will be all come clear. As you can as you can probably hear, this control signal is slowly uh, going through the spectrum, and the bandwidth is determining how many partials are in this case, uh, freezed at the same time. Um, so, 
you if you, if you drive the smooth to a, f a one, it will freeze. So this is what exactly what's what's happening here. If I make the bandwidth really high, you really you will easily hear that that smoothing effect. But it's uh, dr it's actually drifting through the spectrum because my control I I made my control signal in a way that it will it will uh, wrap around and, and go in circles. So if you set the bandwidth high enough, you can hear the effect really well. And you can also do that for the formant shifting. That's that's what uh, what I did for the uh, voice transformations. With all the knowledge we now have, it's it might be easier to uh, to look at the sound. So. What I'm having here is, I'm using a formant shifter on the amplitudes, of course, and the formant shift input also uh, works at sample rate. So I can, uh, at the same thing I did before with the pitch shifting, where I p uh, shifted the lower partials but uh, didn't affect the higher partials, I can do also with the formants. So I can uh, start to uh, move uh, the, the, for the lower partials I'll move the formants down and for another group I will move them up and so on. Uh, and at the same time I'm doing that for the pitch. And also I'm using a noise uh, and the product one. Remember we used the product one for the amps like an EQ. So the noise will uh, do some random EQing of the amplitudes. Which results in a in a uh, rough voice actually. So if you play that sound, it might be more clear than before what we're actually doing here. Oh, is it searching for some sample? Why no. I take good care of my Macintosh computer. So what you see here is here we have the formants. I made four groups and you can define the, the crossover uh, partial and the same applies to the pitches <clears throat> and now you can start to uh, for the pitch shifting for example it's actually very similar to what we did before with those two points but now we have uh, four groups so we can start to pitch shift uh, from the very first partial up to the fifth and that's what the P1 uh, fader is controlling because it broods under its hood like a perched falcon. Because it jumps like a skittish horse and sometimes throws me. Because it is pokey when cold. Because plastic is a sad, strong material that is charming. And also we can do that for the formants. Because it is flighty. Because my mind flies into it through my fingers. Because it leaps forward and backward. It is an endless sniffer and searcher. Because its keys click like hail on a rock. And it winks when it goes out. It puts word heaps in hordes for me, dozens of pockets of gold under boulders and string beds, identical seed pods. And don't forget to the, uh, the noise function, beds. which is also very nice. Because whole worlds of writing can be boldly laid out and then highlighted and vanish in a flash at delete, so it teaches of impermanence and pain. This is something for future updates right now. The the noise is uh, actually applied to the whole spectrum, but it would be quite easy to use something like the Xen oscillator we had before with those two points. Uh, we could uh, multiply that by the noise, and so we can we we could define uh, how much noise we are uh, feeding uh, for the lower partials and for the higher partials. This could be a, a nice improvement for that sound. Okay, so far so good. Um, I'm awaiting your questions now, actually, because uh, 
Yeah. Or you can just tell me that I should show some more of that sound or that sound or whatever you prefer. Just waiting a little for you to catch up for the delay. Ah, it seems like the delay is not too bad. Someone's typing already. And feel free to ask whatever you want, you know. Now it's the time. <laughs> yeah, Louis, you're right, actually. Uh, the tracks V3 is, is very similar to uh, what we are uh, doing here with the with the form and shifting and pitch shifting. And uh, you could also use uh, something like those four groups we had here, where I'm defining four groups. You can also use that on the noise, so you can uh, even define four different groups on how much you inject noise into partials. And yeah, that's an, uh, a large field for experimentation, voice processing. By smoothing a partial. Okay, um, if you do, um, let's make that very simple. Uh, okay, let's start with a constant. This will be some input value. And I'm using a delay on that. That's actually the way uh, Pete did it, uh, did the smoothing uh, in the very first place. So I can call that feedback smooth and that scale one minus smooth. Set that pre zero and have a sound to global controller. Okay, let's go. I'll just call it out. Okay. Just need to scale that. Okay, this will be from zero to one. Okay, so if I set smooth to s uh, zero, this is uh, an explanation for <coughs> exponential smoothing. Uh, it will it will become clear, I guess. Um, what smoothing is is I'm I'm changing the the rate of change. So uh, if a value starts from zero point five and goes down to zero point three, uh, and if I if if I smooth that, the, it will be interpolated between those values. If I smooth that a lot, or with one sample, it's maybe not enough. That's it's too fast. <laughs> okay, with one sample, it's too fast. But we can also demonstrate that with. Forget about the delay. This, the, the copy talk message smooth is exactly what we are doing. Um, I'm specifying a smooth time here, zooming that, zooming that in so you can see that. So if I have a smooth time of 0 0.5 seconds, any change I will do it will take 0 0.5 seconds to reach the new value. You see, if I move the if I, if I move the value, the out value will go to that, but it will take some time. And that's exactly what we are doing with the partials. So think about it like this: if you smooth the amplitudes of the of the spectrum, uh, the changes in the in the the changes will be slower or even uh, if you think about uh, an amplitude would go wiggle wiggle 
wiggle around a certain value like this. As you can see here, the out value doesn't change doesn't change at all. Or very, very uh um not as much as the input value is changing. Maybe we can have a look at that inside the spectrum too. Um yeah, why not with that one and I'm taking a Okay. There are different types of of smoothing. I think they are quite well documented in there. But if you have some specific questions afterwards, feel free. So I'm just using a constant now, so I'm smoothing all partials. Okay. Where's my... Here is my smooth value, I will put that up. Okay. So if I don't smooth and play that... If you look at those amplitudes, they change quite fast and wiggle around. And if I start to smooth, I will smooth out those changes. It sounds a little bit like a reverb. And if I set smooth uh, to one, I will freeze. But I think you can see very clear as I as I move smooth down, you see a lot of small movements and if I move that up, it all gets smoothed out. But again, <clears throat> this smooth this this moving uh is done uh where is it? Yeah, maybe this graphic here demonstrates it quite well. I'm I'm not smoothing the whole stream of amplitudes. I'm smoothing uh, really the changes for each individual uh, partial. Right? That's important. Oh, there are some messages. Oop! I just have to read that. between partial and formant. Okay, I will do that next. We can also smooth the frequencies. Right now I smooth the amplitudes, but we can also smooth the frequencies. I will do that right now. No, not just using the smooth message makes smoothing happen. Uh, it's the module that makes smoothing happen. Happen. Okay, let's try the because there was the the the, the question was from uh, Lasse was uh, not the frequencies directly. Uh, you c we can do that for the for the frequencies as well. Um, Right now, I smooth the amplitudes, but I can also um, I can also smooth the, the the frequencies. Do it like that, and then change that. Here, these are the frex. These are the amplitudes. Okay, very same thi thing. But I'm smoothing the frequencies, so I'm uh, smoothing out the the changes uh, for the frequencies. This will be quite vocoder like. Uh, 
for drum loops it's not that uh, audible actually you hear that the, the frequencies are very static but if we do that for uh, a voice sample then you will hear it will be very vocoder like let's see if we can oh that's a complicated uh, capitoc stuff here so I will not change that right now no but if you do it for the voice it will uh, you it will be very vocoding like okay the long to the yeah I hope Carla will do that Yes, Christian is right. It's effectively a low pass filter at audio rate. But with the difference that I'm not using that low pass filter on the on the whole stream, I'm using that low pass filter for each partial directly. Uh individually, sorry. So there was one other question about about the difference between formants and, and partials, yes. So something was there. I lost it. Is that still a question I should answer? Yes, I agree. Marinos. The movers will do even more crazy things if we uh, were able to to make bigger windows and uh, go a little deeper into the um, into the analysis part. Oh yeah, there was this question about uh, quickly the difference between partial and formant. So the formants are the spectral envelope. So if you look at uh, look at the spectrum, like let's demonstrate that very sh short because the, you, please don't confuse those uh, two words to be the same. Uh, if I do an analysis of Carlos, uh, ooh, I guess that's the right, right one. No, it was the other way, way around. Uh, because you can see them quite clear. Uh. Yeah. So, uh, let's take an oscilloscope display and an oscillator bank. Do that for I think it was 128 partials here, and we'll we'll just look at the amplitudes now, um, because those determine the spectral envelope. Uh, uh, what do you see here? I'll just zoom a little more in. The shape of the spectrum. That's the formants. So we see there's the fundamental here. There's a formant. Uh, and here we see a little formant, and here is a lot another formant. Okay, so this is if you were to low pass that, <coughs> the, or if you were to smooth that stream of, of 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 values, you would get a spectral envelope, and this is what we call the formants. If we shift the formants, we are basically uh, taking. Uh, the spectral envelope and, and shifting it up or down. The important thing is that we, with the Foreman shifter in the SPCSR, we can do that for parts of the spectrum. So if that part of the spectrum contains a, f a strong formant and we shift that down, uh, um, it will be lower in pitch. And the partial is just a single partial, it's just a single uh, index value here. The formants are more about the spectral shape or the spectral envelope. Okay.
Yes. In general, the format is an envelope of where the energy lies in the partials. Yeah, I agree. A bit on formants. Uh, yeah, I just explained that. Maybe, maybe there are some other questions, like specific ones or on specific modules. Or while I'm waiting, uh, I'm thinking about the next tutorial. Will be about uh, how we can. Uh, write those algorithms on your own like what what does the foreman shifter if you look inside that module what does the bit shifting do if you look inside that module so that some of you will be able to uh, develop your own uh, sample rate processing spectral manipulating modules might be a nice way as a spectral processing pro tutorial or something like that I'm just typing here, feel free, feel free to ask. Now it's the time, because it's probably quicker. Yeah, I guess so. It gets quite, uh, yeah, complicated if you want to do that, but I think it would be perfect for the next tutorial. <laughs> That's nice, Marinas. <laughs> okay. If there are no more questions, I would uh, close the session. Okay. Great. Just waiting a little. Yes. Okay. Seems all seem all people seem to be fine. So, thank you for participating in this. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the Spectral Lab or just message me directly. But probably using the the Spectral Lab channel would be nice, so everybody can uh, read what we are talking about and use the Slack. It's definitely worth it and we we can discuss there we can share sounds there so uh yeah just do it so have a good night bye <laughs>